I'm Jeff Young, the brewer from Black Star Co-op Pub and Brewery, and you're watching The Beer Diaries. Rolling fast down I-35 the Greg Zestruck here from the Beer Diaries, here with Jeff Young, the beer team leader here at Black Star Co-op. We are in the brew house. In fact, you may also hear some noise behind you, actually just beyond that door is an incredibly bustling location. When we showed up to start shooting today, we actually had to wait outside the door because the line was literally right to the foyer. In Canada, that's how we say it. US is foyer, Canada, foyer. <laughs> It's very gauche. Fancy. Yeah, so, I mean, great being here. I've been here a bunch of times before. Really good food, really good, good. beer. Uh, you're the beer team leader. Uh -huh. what, does that, what does that mean? Uh, it means out of one and a half people, I am the, uh, the main person. So yeah, we're a small team. Uh, we have four teams here at Black Star. And that's kind of, so we try to have the, the least amount of hierarchy uh, in our, our management structure. Um, such that anybody that's been here has a lot of say in, in the management of it. So because of that, we kind of split up the responsibilities too for like kitchen team, business team, pub team, beer team. I see. So I mean, the concept of a co-op, like how, what's, what's philosophically mean and how does it apply? How do you guys apply it in practice here? A lot of us spend a lot of time in, in bars, especially neighborhood bars, and the idea of uh, basically owning that bar in some fashion uh, and, and having uh, a little more control or, or the loyalty that goes along with that uh, was very inviting to us. So we basically wanted to own the pub that we frequented, frequented the most. So they have the customers themselves. The customers have a, have a, have a voice in the say yes. of what, what happens and how things progress. Exactly. So it's a consumer's co-op. Yeah. Uh, so that's why we have over 3,000 member owners oh, now. Cool. Awesome. Uh, it's pretty crazy. You know, we have them from all over the United States, all over the world. But you know, obviously, our, our Real focus is is the people that are that are coming in here, the member owners that are participating. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and it's kind of like the give and take relationship that they have some sort of responsibility with this place. It's not like they just come in and take. You right, know, just right. come in and drink the product and, and eat the product and go. It's kind of, they come in and they have a responsibility to make this place the best that that it can be, um, because they are they have an ownership of it. They have a stake in it. Um, right. So that makes it different from most of the other businesses out there. Yeah, no, it's very interesting. I mean, do you find from a, from a, being the, the beer team leader, do people give you specific feedback about what they want? Mm -hmm. Like, is that something that, you know, obviously in this situation, you're, you're actually probably even more inclined to act on or certainly take into yeah. consideration. How does that work? Uh, how that works is we had to kind of figure it out. Well, uh, no, I know. It's, well, you, I mean, oh, we set the stage. I mean, you guys have existed for how long? It hasn't been super long. The co-op has been around for seven years. The brew pub has been around for two years. Yeah, so it's pretty... How, how long how long has this location been functioning? Two years. Two years. Yeah, okay. the two years. So yeah, so you know that's the big difference is once we started operations, is how do you incorporate that ownership? How do you incorporate three three thousand people, uh, their opinions, their yeah, ideas, yeah. their their harebrained opinions, <laughs> and then their you know really some, awesome some, opinions. Some of them are probably quite loud too. You know, not in a negative way, but they have they're very very passionate and forceful sure. about their. Oh opinion. yeah, we got passionate people. Yeah. You put you put opinionated people in beer together and. and you get some pretty just good, good ideas. Times. <laughs> just good times. <laughs> yeah, just good times. Um, but it, trying to incorporate uh, those ideas from the different people, mm -hmm. uh, you know, is something we certainly had to try to figure out, especially on a operational uh, basis. Where you know, do you want the member owners going back into the kitchen and telling them how to slice the bread or yeah, something? Yeah, yeah. You got to uh, you got to draw reasonable lines. Yeah, obviously. yeah. So where is that line, and and how can we incorporate people? Um, and we have a lot of different ways, and we could go on and on about it. Mm. Uh, with, on the beer side of things, there's a few ways that I try to incorporate our member owners. Uh, the first one being the design of some of our beers. So not all the beers are designed by member owners, but I like to try to um, throw out some, some beers there that uh, we can get together in kind of a forum. Uh, talk about what kind of beer we might want for this season, uh, what kind of flavors, what kind of ingredients we want to use, and, and we, uh, I put all that together and I come back and brew it. During the process, 
will get, uh, and I've done a couple of these now called homebrew challenges. So we mm. get member owners, I'll put out a challenge. And we've done two, and, the, and they're both really cool. Uh, the first one was anything barrel aged. I said, I have four barrels. Oh, you cool. give me something to put in there, uh, and I'll brew it. One interesting thing I've heard about you from a brewery, uh, sorry, a show called Brewed by a guy named Mike Mann, who's standing <laughs> right there. <laughs> Is that you're actually a chemist? I started working in laboratories when I was 18, just out of high school. Um, yeah. Yeah, sorry, they may be out here, but there's some hootenanny going on over there. There is, and it's awesome. That's a good sound because uh, we have a dart team, Black Star oh. dart team, and they just happen to be playing tonight. And they're too. probably winning, that's why the hootenanny. I think that hootenanny meant uh, they just got some, some awesome. good darts. Good for them. Yeah, good for them. You said you were, I think you said you were doing. Uh, uh, worked as a as the, right out of school in labs mm -hmm. and had that experience, and then it was very natural here. Like, yeah, working in labs, my my kind of my educational background uh, was math. I got a math degree, and then started doing chemistry, and then started doing engineering. I wanted to do uh, electrical engineering, oh, okay. so trying to put all those things together and trying to figure out, you know, how to uh, fuse those different kinds of, of things that I like doing into one satisfying job. Uh, I never quite got it in in the chemistry. Yeah. Field, you know. Uh, even more recently, I was an analytical chemist at a pharmaceutical company. Mm, okay. Cool drugs, making some awesome drugs all day long, and uh, that was that was gratifying. Uh, in that you got to use a lot of your technical. Uh, yeah, it's probably knowledge. interestingly challenging too. Like, very, very challenging. Uh, but the thing that was missing was. Um, the satisfaction of people enjoying your product. And I guess you could. <laughs> people I do you... enjoy drugs <laughs> often, but I think what you're talking about is like therapeutic drugs, just to be clear. Yeah, yeah. Well, I did make a Marinol uh, at one point, which is the, the pill form of THC. Oh, well, that's uh, good. That was Quite pretty cool. And I imagine circles. there's some people enjoying those yeah. out there, too. Um, but I just don't get to sit there and watch them like I do here, watch yeah, the yeah. And... yeah, it's probably, it's probably really cool. Because I mean, one of the interesting things, there's probably some interesting challenges um, in, in the brew pub format, because one thing that you guys have is you guys actually have a lot of other very good taps of big name beers right along your side mm -hmm. yours. So there's that challenge of getting the pick one of yours. It definitely is a challenge. That would be the word uh, that I would put. And it's challenging to do that, uh, and I see it as a challenge. Uh, so we're going to put up some of the best beers in the nation, and you know I'm not going to say I, I make better beers, but I have to keep up with them. Yeah, um, yeah. Which is which is a challenge, and and if I'm not, it becomes very obvious very quickly. But I think what that does is allow me to realize that my beers are not up to the standards uh, of like the national level or the commercial beers that we have on tap. Whereas if we only had our beers, that's just kind of like. Uh, well, yeah, uh, insular. Sort of, like you don't yeah, really yeah. know. But that comp you find you thrive in that competition. Absolutely. Unfortunately, yeah, there, there's that. <laughs> Unfortunately? You know, yeah, the it's competition good, it's, 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 it's good, it's good I mean, to it's, have, but because it, that it can must get be away the, from you. Yeah, but that must be the thing that really warms your heart, though, is when you see someone reach for one of yours, especially yes. if there's a similar style beer available. But, you know, it's, it's interesting, because if you yeah, approach it the right way, it can be very inspiring and very yeah. cause to be really engaged in it. It's really great. Yeah. Or you can see it as kind of a narcissism, which I think is kind of the other ingredient that we're all talking all about you, here. All I need to do is win an award, and then it's just going to go off the rails. That's all these yeah. uh, have happened. Yeah. Uh, but no, the, I mean, because the beer, like, also the food here is very, very good. I think mm -hmm. that's one of the things that's, that brings people here is the food is delicious. One question I had is when you are brewing, are you think, taking into consideration some specific dishes on the menu or the type of food you have? Are you making specific beers that you know will go well with the food? No. No. Because they all I don't go, know because <laughs> they all go well with the food. That's the right answer. Because I, I don't know much about uh, about cooking and, and oh, okay. like this has been uh, quite an experience for me to work with passionate people in a different field. So even though it's still like consumer, uh, uh, you know, food yeah. food products, uh, to me it's, it feels like a very alien field. Like you know, I I hardly know what they are up to really? from That's time to time. Uh, I don't cook. I don't like cooking. Okay. Uh, it's not my thing. I, I, I approach brewing from more of the uh, experimental, scientific side. Yeah, whereas a lot of um, brewers, home brewers, might approach it from from they love to cook. Like and the, the, foodie, the foodie, the foodie side. And they think I heard, mm -hmm. hey, these things go, these ingredients go well together. Let's yeah. try it. Have you found that like this has become a real destination in Austin? Yes, um, fortunately so. And I feel like we, we we've definitely had to earn that. Yeah, people um, have to believe that you're you're kicking mm -hmm. butt on that side of things. The blessing and the curse was five years after you know we people started talking about us or we started talking to people, we opened and then we had to live up to that, which of course was very challenging at first because as you can imagine, uh, just opening up a restaurant of this of this size and, and yeah. the production brewery, 
uh, it's difficult. It takes a little time. Well, to synchronizing kind of wrap up all the stuff and the, you know, like you know, having the beer ready and the food menu figured out and actually just you have to you know, a lot of restaurants go through and, and brew pubs go through this sort of bumpy stage initially yeah. where people also make their decision in the yeah. long term. Yeah, and all eyes were on us yeah. from day one, which made it really tough. Um, and you know, I would say our first year was, in, in my opinion, a little rough. That we were trying to win people over. We were learning things. We were getting comfortable. But fortunately, enough people believed in us and, and the fact that we would get through those things. Yeah. Um, that you know, after we hit uh, probably the, the beginning of our second year, I just started feeling like, okay, I, this is this is where I wanted to be. And I think then slowly people started to turn around, being like, oh, okay, they really are what they said they were going to be, and 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 they're. A, a great place. Craft beers become a big deal in Austin. How, what part do you guys play? What do you, how do you think the scene has changed? So when we first started, we we're like, man, this this is like a desert of a, <laughs> of a craft beer scene. Yeah. And we we're like, man, we're gonna be frontiersmen or, or something. But you know, over the, the skin the, caps and <laughs> beer and pitchers and <laughs> taking on the West. Right. So we figured, you know, from a from a business standpoint, uh, there was definitely an undersaturation yeah, of, for sure, of for sure. beer. Um, so we hoped to to. Uh, capitalize on that. Once we actually opened, which would be two years ago, so did everyone else. Uh, and that was... It was kind of, oh, yeah, there was a lot of action in, within, in that Yeah, period. the last two years, uh, I, I swear there there had to have been maybe 10 in the in that Yeah, I was about Austin to yeah, I, I mean, you know, I, we've been kind of counting and keeping track, I think up to... Up to 10. Up, well, yeah, up to, four, well, up to four years ago, there were like six... Um, six, like three brew pubs, three, three breweries, and then and then all, now there's twenty. Okay. So in that, in that period, like it's just basically gone bonkers. Yeah. And yeah. there's actually and there's still more opening. Like I mean, yeah. I think that's great. It's been really interesting to watch that. I think from the inside, um, because I know all those people. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I wish them the best, and I get to kind of watch how how they approach it. We all approach it differently. And we just got back from uh, the Great American Beer Festival yeah, yeah. in Denver, Colorado. Uh, our second year where we actually um, uh, had a booth and served yeah, beers. Yeah, how was and that? That was great, really fun. I mean, that must be like an amazing time. It like, is. It like, is. From last year when we went, uh, I think Texas, they do it by region, but the Texas booths, you know, maybe. Oh, had so you like guys are all kind of clumped into a, mm -hmm. a physical yeah. co arrangement. And it just that's probably dangerous blew up leather. this yeah. year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it was just really cool to see all these people. A lot of variety, too. Like, I think what's one thing I found very interesting about the Texas brewers as well is a lot are taking very different angles in yes. terms of, you know, some are focusing on Belgian, some are focusing on sours. I mean, mm -hmm. they all make a bit of everything. Some are more mm -hmm. experimental, some mm -hmm. are, you know, awesome on the Rhine Heights, Gabotten purity stuff. Like, it's very impressive. Right. how the people can, like, just the range of beer available here, yeah. too. It's not all just IPAs, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, it's just a great range of stuff. Yeah, and I think that speaks to just the individuality that that brewers go into this having. It's that they have their style that they are going to introduce, that they're going to... Yeah, their personal... Yeah, to give to the world. And, and I think that's cool. It's not like they're just trying to make what sells. They make what they believe in, and uh, yeah. they put their, themselves out there. And that's another way that I get to sit back and, and watch and, and enjoy and see how these other personalities, you know, what their style is, mm -hmm. what kind of beers they're making. Do you have a desire to, like, have the beer reach a broader audience? Like, I mean, I think that, you know, currently, <coughs> and as per the laws, I mean, you have to sell within the confines here. Is there, mm -hmm. do you have a desire to go broader than that, like, if you could? I do. I don't know how broad... I would want to get because I mean the system you have here. How many barrel system do you guys have? Ten barrel system. So it's kind of, that's a good size. I mean, it could. We sell. We can easily sell about 700, 750 on site. So that would leave not a whole lot left yeah, over. To, so if we wanted to be broader, we would have to uh, uh, get another facility. Is it primarily fermentation space that that is, is the tough part? You think? Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. Tank space. <laughs> um, we're gonna start from the beers in a moment. I have one question because we're mm -hmm. running out of beer here on these. How do you name your beers? So, you know, sometimes you're just sitting around with friends and you come up with something funny like willy-nilly beer <laughs> and then you start thinking of, oh, that would be fun to like, you know, what just throw it, what, in what just some different things. Yeah. You know, it would be just this real lackadaisical Random. kind of like, wee, throw in, throw in whatever ingredients in there. It would be the willy-nilly and that's kind of, so the inspiration came from the you have trouble with that though, you want to measure precisely. Yeah, I would never do the yeah, willy-nilly yeah. beer. It's about just everyday life, and sometimes you got a good idea for something, and and you make a beer out of it, and and then you try to get the essence of that beer kind of in a name, um, or you're just you have no idea what the name is. You just start asking all your drunk friends, and they come up with something. Yeah, yeah, like, That's yeah. awesome. I'm gonna take that. 
that's always been one of the biggest things is, is being true to the inspirations that you have and trying to have an outlet for it as, as an artist or a craftsman. Right, right, right. Is you need an outlet for the things that interest you. Yeah. Uh, and this just happens sure. to be mine. Um, do you have, how much stuff do you have in regular rotation? I think we talked earlier, you have five or six things normally from your own on tap. Uh, are there things that you know fans that are the membership and fans can come back and always rely on seeing? What, what, what are some of those beers? Like what would be what so? How we split that up and the inspiration for kind of our um, format of of our beer catalog was actually a mathematical thing. So that's what I <laughs> essentially got my degree in was was math. Yeah. And uh, kind of how I saw it was uh, we had this division of of beers. You could almost divide them into two distinct categories, rational and irrational. Uh, the rational ones, uh, in a mathematical sense, would be the ones that you're familiar with that you can construct giving known parameters. So the irrational beers generally, and it's not always the case because marketing and, and philosophy don't ever, <laughs> don't always go side by side, uh, but the irrational beers in general have some sort of extra character about them that is uh, greater than the sum of their parts. You know, something, right, some right. X factor, something that can't be uh, uh, concisely defined. Um, something like a, a sour beer or a barrel aged beer, right. um, or just you know some special ingredient. Like sometimes we get a uh, fresh hops. Like they pick them from the vines uh, the day well, a day, and then they ship it overnight to us. We get them the next day and put them directly into the beer. So it's like the freshest thing that you right, can get, right. and you just can't you can't mimic that kind of flavor, that, that right. factor in there. So that makes it kind of an irrational beer. Interesting. Um, so we divide our beers into, uh, so philosophically into rational and irrational. Um, as far as uh, consumption goes, the rational beers are the ones that you're going to have more year round. So, so right now you have, I think there's one, your, your session beer is, is out. Um, so you have, five, four, we have four beers behind four. us. Mm -hmm. So we were drinking the high esteem. Yeah, so which, well, is, which is really we can continue to drink it. This wow. is high esteem. We'll, we'll have to be careful with this one if it's a 20% whiskey beer, but it's not. <laughs> it's not, it's not. I know it's a... It's a uh, it's something like 4.7%. Um, it's supposed to be kind of our most approachable beer. Uh, the interesting thing about this one, the reason I love this one so much is, for one, it's the hardest beer to make here. This is the oh, most difficult. I spend the most time trying to get this damn beer right. And this is one of the rational ones? That this is one of the rational ones, yeah. But the uh, tricky thing about it is it uses a lot of local wildflower honey. And, oh, wow. and one of the big differences uh, in, in this beer and, and all the other beers that we make or all the other beers that you'll see around town is it's really hard to get local ingredients for your beers um, uh, you know, to any degree because the malts usually come from the Midwest or Canada yeah. or England. Or, yeah, Europe. Uh, the, the hops aren't here. The yeast mm -hmm. is from laboratories. And the water is local yeah, usually. Yeah. Um, so that's good. But it's, it's really hard to find good... Uh, ingredients locally that you can throw in there to a large scale. You know, we can always throw, we can always go down to uh, the farmer's market and throw in some, some actual local ingredients on a small scale, um, but, you know, something bigger that's going to be our, our rational beer, uh, we have to find more of it. So I'll use, in this beer, I think it's about 40 pounds of uh, good flow local wildflower honey. 40 pounds? 40 pounds, yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's the least that we use. We have that's a beer that 10, uses 10, 200 10, a 10 pounds. barrel. Mm -hmm. Wow. The thing that I find interesting about this one, I mean, it's, it's actually pretty well hopped, so mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely got a nice hop profile, mm -hmm. uh, very light on the palate, and very dry. You know, mm -hmm. like, it finishes really nicely dry, but there's also yeah. like a sort of a mid-palate, mid-taste kind of sweetness, but it's yeah. not, it, but it's... Well said. Yeah, that, yeah that's no, exactly what I would say but, about but it's, it, but, it, but, you know, and then when I'm finished, though, I still have a really nice kind of slightly bitter aftertaste. Yeah. Like, it's very palate cleansing and... It's really, it's really nice. Yeah. I think, I think what, so was your intent just to have something that's like a very easy drink and anytime someone picks it up, go for it, you'll love this yes, beer? Yes, but only in so much as it would still be a beer that I would be proud of, that, I, that would yeah, have some it. character, would have some flavor. And that's, a, that's the hard part. That's why I say it's such a hard beer, is you're making all these subtle flavors into this nice drinkable beer. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's fine if somebody just comes and you know starts drinking the beer and, and chugging it and not even thinking about it. But if somebody actually wants to look when in you really there, think about this beer, I mean, what, what amazes me? Going on. Oh, it does. And what amazes me about it is, and you know, it's funny. Cause obviously, right now in season are the honey beers because of the presidential honey beer. Uh, and so there's a lot of them around. <laughs> yeah. Um, some are you know some are a little bit sweet and a little bit heavier. Um, this one is just really fresh and refreshing. Like it, it you know, I think it, it, it it's 
it is surprising in the context of what the ingredients are. It's a difficult thing to do. This, I've brewed this beer more than any other beer and it changes just about every time. I'm always trying to tweak something and it's just the subtleties yeah, of, of all these ingredients are really difficult to, yeah, to get balanced. Um, so the next one, should we go that to this next one? On the, sure. On the, um, um, so this one is Double D. So this one is another rational beer. Uh, one of the very earliest recipes that I had. Brewed it for the first year, maybe first year and a half, and then dropped it. You just weren't you weren't getting the flavors you wanted. You yeah, I just could, yeah, I couldn't. You know, I adjusted it every time. I was like, ah, oh, it's still not coming out the way I wanted it. So I just gave up on it. I figured I'll come back to it. Uh, but essentially, I wanted to bring out the malt character. Like this is an expression of malt. Yeah, was, I, I, I totally got that. So. Yeah, it's, but, a, it's a bit spicy though too. Like it's a spiciness to it. Yeah, that's probably from the uh, kind of. So pretty much all of this is English based. If that even like, means anything, like, like because even the Kent Goldings and yeah, like, things like so Willamette. So it's the English or the American version of of their Fuggles, which is oh, kind of a right. spicy herbal yeah. okay, right, kind yeah. of hop. So you get that from there. Um, the base malt is their premium hand turned floor malted wow. uh, uh, malt called Maris Otter, and you just taste this this wonderful kind of like biscuit earthy undertone with on top of that. Almost like a fruity cherry um, yeah. spiciness. It's still to very it. light. Mm -hmm. You know, again, like the body in this is delightful and not sweet. Again, mm -hmm. finishing really nice and dry. Mm -hmm. It's a really very very tasty. So yeah, so this was the was this the first first or second batch back from its little hiatus, and you know I was very cautious about. It. I was like, ah, I'm gonna brew it again. I don't know. I hope <laughs> it comes out. So you think it's gonna come in a regular rotation again, the way it's turning out now? Like yeah. it, it is. A, it's very refreshing. It's I really enjoy it. People like. Ambers, you know, so this yeah. is kind of our amber. It's pretty, it's, it's, it's a pretty aggressive amber though, you know, like I think, I think the, That's the how we do. Yeah, I think, I think the, the sort of the hop profile certainly will be, will, an amber person will kind of, because I think sometimes they go for the ambers because they're, 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 they're not as, not as aggressive on the hopping, yeah. but yeah. It really, no, it's really tasty. Like, like I said, I really got that spiciness and like I said, yeah. the bit of fruit underneath is really tasty. Yeah. Let's move on down the line. What is this? This is, is our biggest seller, uh, Vulcan. Ah, yes, I think that's one I've recognized for sure. Yeah. So this was, uh, <laughs> this was, it's almost the opposite of high esteem. Whereas high esteem can never seem to like, you know, has the nuances of trying to get it right and putting the balance. This, you just throw in some good ingredients, you throw in a whole hell of a lot of them and you just get a really good beer. A lot of hops. A lot of hops in this one. I right. think that, you know, a lot of hops makes generally a tasty beer. Is it, is it a, a pale or an IPA, or where would you put this one? Given that it's close to seven, it's six point seven percent. I think so. A, probably an IPA then. Yeah, it's closer to IPA. You know, it's got, again the light body. Like it's not. It's like it's interesting. Cause, I mean, some you know some of the some of the malt profile in, in an IPA can get pretty, and then sometimes the oils. You know, mm -hmm. can, you can actually get almost an oily finish. Like, this mm -hmm. is a very nice. Again, all these beers so far, nice tight, clean finish. Like mm -hmm. very very light. Yeah, that's that's something across the board that I try to work on here with all the beers is we're in Austin, Texas. Yeah, yeah. You can't have too cloying, you can't have, you know, big lingering aftertaste is usually as the crisper beer. Yeah. So any style that you take, if you put a little twist of, of crispness on it, uh, people around here will like Very it. Very nice more. hops though. I mean like, like lovely hops. hop Yeah, and I think it's balanced too in the end for sure. Like it just it's just yeah, any, Vulcan, any, any stories where where the name come from for this? Vulcan, um, I didn't even think about this till years after I made it, but it's not the uh, Star Trek can't do with this hand. Star Trek. <laughs> but you're left handed, so you can do it with your left hand, obviously. I do it with my left hand. I could never do it with the right. Some weird Ninja Turtle looking thing. Ah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so in Birmingham, Alabama is when I was going to uh, the brewing school. So then you're uh, in Birmingham. Yeah, Birmingham, so they Alabama. Did they bounce you around then at the brewing school? No, so that's where I was a chemist and you start it kind of like correspondence and oh, then you go up there and you finish okay. the thing on site. Got it. Um, so I was up there and you know started brewing some beers and uh, one of my inspirations was out of Athens, Georgia, Terrapin does a lot of mm. rye, hoppy rye beers. Mm. Um, so I was like, that's cool, I'm gonna take that. Um, so I brewed a beer there in Birmingham and it happened to be, I lived uh, at the base of what was called Red Mountain okay. um, and that probably means nothing to most people. It's probably a red mountain, I'm thinking. That's my, my suspicion. It's a mountain, it's fairly red. It's fairly red. It's fairly red. Well, at the top of it, it has the largest iron statue in North America, uh, and it's Vulcan, oh. uh, the, the god of fire and forge. Yeah, yeah. 
and How it's pretty did awesome. That get there? Like, huh? Who put that up there? The gods. I don't know. <laughs> we need a statue. So it's huge. And in the it's, it's funny. There's a whole joke about and the whole a, thing. He's got a beer. He's going to beer appears in your hand. And... Yes. Well, yeah, he's holding up like this. Um, a torch? It's a torch. But the creepy thing about it is I think they light the torch if somebody dies in a car accident. Mm. Uh, because that has something to do with kind of like iron or metal or wow. I don't know. It's, it's really strange creepy. local traditions wherever you were. Yeah, UT, like they light up the building uh, if they win, the tower. Mm, yeah. They light up. It's torch if somebody dies. <laughs> the uh, torch of Vulcan. Well, anyway, the guy's wow. pantsless. The point of that was <laughs> my so view. He's a, he's a pantsless statue. So that's a, like that's immense. The immense pantsless statue. The biggest iron ass in North America. <laughs> and it's funny because he has an apron, you know, because he's, oh, he's so, working so he's on like so an anvil. back in the front, but the back yeah. is all, it's business in, in the front, party in the back. Yes. It's kind of like, it's kind of, that's all. <laughs> My goodness. So, and, and the, the, always the joke was, he's a god, you know, and you would think a god would have a nice physique, but he had the flattest <laughs> ass ever. Like, they didn't even chisel him a nice, rounded ass. It was like this sad, flat wow. god ass. <laughs> well, he probably shape changed it, and he just thought that was convenient because he was busy. Yeah. yeah he didn't I care. don't know. I think we should move uh, on to the next beer. That's Vulcan. The story. Yeah. That was this one, I mean, when you pour it, when I had this poured, I had this actually as my, when I, we got here, we, mm -hmm. a whole bunch of us tried this. Um, this is sour you did, and the head was immense. Like it was a really big, rich, fluffy head. Mm -hmm. uh, old dewberry, I believe. Is that correct? Old sour dewberry. Old sour dewberry. Mm -hmm. um, really tasty, and I mean, you talk about the process. This is a little bit different than you know a lot of the sour beers end up, you know, sitting in a sitting in a barrel and either having, um, you know, special yeast supplied or bacteria, lactobacillus. Yeah. Um, you said it's something a little bit different. A little different, yeah. So going back a little bit, the fact that. Uh, one of the differences between breweries and brew pubs is brew pubs are, are often tied for space. You know, like we talked yeah. about earlier, we are we are up against the walls right now. Um, so you don't have a lot of storage space to let something sit there and get funky for a year or two. So uh, something that I was always interested in was uh, other means of souring beer, uh, in particular, much more quickly. And natural, though, too. That's one thing you've emphasized. And natural, natural yeah, method, yeah, yeah, and, and naturally. So, yeah, you can do the barrel aging, uh, and you can get the depth from, from the age and, and the different bacteria and the oak, too. Um, and that's awesome, and that's great. And we try to do some of that, too. But I think another thing that's, that's really cool is to get some uh, sourness in the beer uh, in the basically in the same time frame as you would any of the other beers, you know, within a couple weeks, two or right. three weeks to get a nice sour beer. Because you said this was just, when you said this was Less two weeks. two weeks. Yeah, you said two weeks old. I'm like, you mean they came out of the barrel two weeks ago? And you're like, no, 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 this is two weeks. I was like, I'm blown away by that. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Um, and, and of course, this is like almost 9%. So it definitely could age for a little while. But again, on the brew pub scale, a lot of times we just kind of have to uh, push beers through like we can't sit on them for very long and we would love to age them a little bit longer and we always do little aged versions um, yeah yeah so instead of doing uh, uh, the souring like we were talking about in barrels uh, this is sour mashing so essentially what I do is mash in 85% of the grains which is just uh, probably doesn't mean anything to you taking the uh, uh, the grain themselves uh, putting it in, in hot water. So it's kind of getting the sugars out, getting the enzymes. Yeah. Breaking down the starches. Their thing. Right. So I let 85% of the mash turn into sugars. And okay. then instead of finishing the brew process then, I throw in, uh, I drop the temperature down to 120. And then I allow uh, 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 some natural bacteria uh, to inoculate it from some of the other malt. I put in the remainder of the 15% the of the malt put it back into the mash tun and that just inoculates it. So I let it sit there for two days and it gets sour and funky and oh, really crazy. And then I and then I just uh, continue with the brew process after a couple days. We don't really get to have different rooms for you know yeah, sour yeah, things, yeah, yeah. all these bacteria over important here. to stay clean. Yeah, sure. so this is a really good way to get that sourness without uh, contaminating the rest of your brewery. It yeah. only takes two extra days, uh, but you just, you know, there's different considerations you need to have. Some beers work with this sourness and some don't, and that's kind of the experiment with this. And this is really tasty. I mean, like like I said, um, I think we were talking about it earlier. Definitely like some you know dark fruits. It's kind of a, it's a kind of a fruit sour flavor. Yeah. Um, but as you said, there's no fruit put into it, yeah, which no again fruit. is sort of surprising. Um, again, 
light finish. Not it's by no means very very heavy on the alcohol warming or anything, but the nicest. I wouldn't call it finish dry. It's just got like a nice sour finish. It's mm -hmm. but and I, I call it in a you know it doesn't taste like the other sours. You know it's got it's unique flavor that I haven't that really tried before. But really really tasty. Yeah. Like it's a really very refreshing beer. Again, I think certain foods are probably like cheese, like really a really great yeah. blue cheese or something. This would blow it away. Yeah, it desserts fabulous. and cheeses, and, yeah. and the the kitchen is going to be pairing a lot of foods with this, uh, and this is like the dessert. Yeah, uh, it's course. really neat. Very cool. What what uh, music do folks brew to when you? A lot of the brewers we've spoken to around town brew to cool music. Is there anything particularly you like? It's a lot of Jackson Five. Um, or kind uh, of, cl Ace classic, of classic, classic. Kind of. Yeah, some good like. Upbeat music, uh, some good soul going on. Purity Ring and Grimes and uh, uh, Twin Shadows. Uh, I like that song, or all those songs. Last question would be, obviously, you, there's a lot of colleagues around town. Um, any particular beers that stand out for you that are being made here in the Austin area that you really like? Some of the things I really like. And I think you guys, I, I saw on your trailer um, uh, that you went down to Thirsty Planet. Yeah, yeah. I really like, I really respect what they're doing down there. Uh, hops and Grain and 512 Brewing. Uh, yeah, yeah. They've been around for a while and then they're really that low key, good. like below the radar. Uh, but they're just so good, so yeah, solid. Very, very good. You know, and I appreciate things like that. So the last thing we do is uh, pick a favorite beer here. And I, I got to say, I love the old Sour Dewberry. That was a really interesting beer. I hadn't tasted flavors like that. It's just a really, you know, like, clean and, and approachable sour, really delicious. And I gotta say, the high steam as a second was, you know, when you really sit and think, as you said, think about it and like taste the flavors and really get into it, it was super solid, mm -hmm. very, very good. Um, and that brings us to the end. So the end is? Is it cheers? Cheers to the double D. Cheers. Cheers. Schlant. Schlant. Nazdrovia. You don't have to match me, you can do All other right. way, whatever. <laughs> Prost. Just drink. All right, drinks. Thank you, gentlemen. And that's me signing off, Greg from the Beer Diaries.